Shalom, Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. So it's a privilege to be here and to share the Word of God uh, with you. And it's always encouraging to hear about the work of the team for, ev for Jewish evangelism, you know, the door-to-door -door Bible distribution team. Uh, you know, this week they, they went to the Russian quarters and gave some nine sets and one full Bible, one Bible that is English Bible, and they also had some very interesting conversations. Uh, one of them, a man, asked, uh, why does God allow so many innocent people to suffer where the guilty ones are doing very well? The, you know, this type of questions, I want to tell you, open up the door for great conversations, and the team did an excellent work in showing that it is not God's fault, but, but that God loves everyone and desires all to come to a saving knowledge of Yeshua. You know, this man actually accepted the Bible, uh, the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament in his home. He also took Isaiah 53, beautiful pamphlet, a powerful chapter. And we pray that the word will find its way into his heart and he will say Yeshua. There was another not so nice and uh, <laughs> told them that he hates missionary. And when I read that they rejoice, recalling what Yeshua said in Matthew, he said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things because of me. You know, it reminded me of Peter and John, who, who also rejoiced when they were actually beaten up and persecuted at the temple. No, they had many more encounterings. Some of these, by the way, are in your bulletin uh, every week, and you can also receive the weekly news through email to get the whole story. Uh, in other news, uh, not so good. You know, I read that this past week, the evangelist, Franklin Graham, had been banned from preaching in the UK. You know, whether we agree with this organization or not, this is a major turn of event. Uh, Graham was scheduled to conduct a preaching tour in uh, the UK in 2020, but the whole host of towns and local councils have now cancelled his tour dates, banning him from their venues. Why? Because Franklin Graham does not agree with homosexuality. He holds a different moral uh, viewpoint based on the scriptures. But should we be surprised at this point? Should we? The message of the Bible is increasingly being despised for it is going countercurrent from what they call progression and evolution. I expect even great opposition as we're moving forwards towards the end time. And speaking of end times, something happened in Israel. <laughs> Interesting. In Israel, there seems to be an increasing awakening somehow this week. You know, one prominent religious figure said that this past week, and I quote, we are currently, he says, in the midst of the war of Gog and Magog. And the war of Gog and Magog, the actual shooting and fighting with physical weapons will only come at the end. That was described, he said, in the Bible by the prophets. Most of the war, the beginning will be a war of faith, end of quote. You know, I want to tell you, this is quite a statement, and I pray that many will hear what he says, that it's in the Bible. And we go and seek what the prophets are saying about our time. And this particular rabbi said that now, and I quote, we should get the word out now that the Messiah is closer than ever is a matter of life and death. And he added, the situation is explosive more than you can possibly imagine. Maybe they can see it better there in Israel than we can here in North Africa, where we're very comfortable, um, America. <laughs> I was born in North Africa, that's why. Now we cannot, we cannot but fully agree with him, of course, and we can add that it's not only a matter of physical life and death, it's a matter of spiritual life and death, right? The no Ezekiel 38, 39, for them it is the equivalent of the New Testament Armageddon, and they feel it increasingly coming closer as they see, by the way, in Israel, you know, continual bombing of the Iranian and Syrian targets uh, right at the border in the north. Another one. Uh, and this one I can name, it's uh, Shlomo Amar, Rabbi Shlomo Amar, a former Sephardic rabbi of Israel. He said this past Thursday, the 20th of February, 2020, and I quote, he says, all the great rabbis of this generation are saying that the Messiah is about to reveal himself. All the signs the prophet gave, all the signs predicted in the Gemara, the Mishnah, the Midrash, everything is taking place one by one. We all need to remain strong for a little bit longer, end of quote. See that while they, they do not have the New Testament, right? They feel the imminent coming of the Messiah. How much more should we that we have the words of Jesus 
that we have the words of Paul, the words of John in Revelation. And notice the, these disasters, the, these pestilence around the world. You know, one of them said, he said, natural disasters are occurring all over the world, including the cor coronavirus, fires in Australia, some other disasters that, that was to occur in the atmosphere is occurring right now, right? The coronavirus, I believe, is one of these pestilences that was prophesied to perceive the second coming, right? This is what Jesus says in Matthew 24. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. This is before the final wars, right? You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nations and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, an earthquake in various places. This is it, pestilences. In the Greek, which describes a widespread contagious disease like the cor coronavirus, which modern medicine cannot yet find a cure. And it is at this time spreading, apparently, all over. You know, yesterday I read that 26 countries have confirmed the presence of the virus. Israel and Lebanon yesterday found their first one, and this morning I read that Israel found nine more. And it seems that they're fully cannot, they cannot contain it, right? And there are nine cases here in, in Canada. And I read just before coming up that uh, in, in South Korea, it, it doubled from yesterday to today, from 229 to 433. It's time to pray. It's time to pray. I believe that the Lord is trying to awaken the people around, that he's coming very soon. And the government... In Israel seems to have this feeling of a great change that is coming in this world. You know that just this past Wednesday again, the, the Israeli defense minister, Naftali Bennett, right, insisted that we are living in the days of the third temple. Imagine he said that. I want to quote what he says. We need to understand the big picture. Today we are in the time of the third temple. Right? Well, while the nation of Israel is largely secular, they nevertheless have this inner belief in the prophecies of the scriptures, and this is, in many ways, good news, for it opened the doors to the scriptures. It allows us to bring out the message of the prophet. And this is precisely what we will see today in our study of Zechariah, where we will see a great awakening in Israel during the time of the tribulation. Let's open up our scriptures to Zechariah chapter 5. You know, opening up chapter 5 and 6 of this great book is like being transported right to the very end. Right? It begins with no warning or introduction. Each of the remaining visions are given with fewer words, so rapidly as if one sees a movie in fast motion again. Here again, the prophet and ourselves are challenged with a question just in verse 2. What do you see? He says. The angel asked the prophet. And throughout the prophet asked, but what is this? And again, what are these? And in order to make sense of these prophecies, one needs to stop and examine the vision in slow motion. This is when one fast understands that we are brought right in the midst of the tribulation time, right at the threshold of the last three and a half years. And there one will recognize the same pattern as the one in the book of Revelation, something we will Later seen in this study. The first vision begins with a touch of grace. This is our God, by the way. A touch of grace. The prophet sees a flying scroll, a huge one, all over the world. It seems to be containing the word of God. Like the gospel in the sky. For all to see as a final warning. A last counsel from God to men to repent. For what follows are the final words. And the most troublesome time the earth has ever seen, as Jesus says in Matthew 24. The next vision is the wickedness, okay, itself carried by two flying individuals and bring it to the same place where the first rebellion began. You know where? Babylon, the land of Shinar, it says. Then the next vision, those of the fourth horsemen, represents the last conflict, the last moment in history, the vials, the, the bulls. In Revelation. And yet, yet God's mercy and tenderness is seen within this chaotic conflict. Did you know that one of the horsemen rides a white horse? A white horse. This is not the second coming, but this is a coming of Yeshua, like an extra one, just before to protect his own people. 
within the core of the most raging war ever. And finally, he comes back to put an end to these conflicts forever and ever. And as one reads this account, one wonders, why so fast? Why are these things given so rapidly? Perhaps to tell her that there's no time to lose. At the end, one is left with a sense of urgency, with a pressing message to share, because you want to share it. Because once the end prophecies are unleashed, it goes very fast, as we can even see today a little bit of it. Right? It's coming very fast. Furthermore, while today we can better understand the book than, let's say, 100 years ago, one wonders, at, as he reads all this account, what Zacharian, the people there in Israel, understood. For these visions are completely prophetic. But for the people of the time, I want to tell you, it may have been one of the most comforting message ever, even if they could not make sense of the many details. You, I want to bring you to the last verse of the seventh vision, Zechariah 6.15. Even those from afar shall come to build the temple of the Lord, he tells them. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. And this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. While it was so difficult for them to, to work the building of the temple, day after day, persecution after persecution, yet at the end, God tells them that even the Gentiles will come and build it for you. He's talking about the millennium. It is there that he again says that Israel and the whole world will know that Yeshua has, sent, uh, has been sent. As for us today, we also do not understand the whole thing. We do not understand all the prophecy. And so the final words are so much for us. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. All these things are so much more will come to pass. Amen. Let us now go to, to see these wonderful visions. Which and above all give us that sense of urgency to want to share. Let's read the first four verses of Zechariah 5. Then I lift up my eyes again and looked, and behold, there was a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, and it's with 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals will be purged according to the writing on the one side. And everyone who swears will be purged according to the writings on the other side. I will make it go forth, declares the Lord. And it will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely in my name. And I will spend the night within that house and consume it and consume its timber and stones. Now in this vision, Zachariah sees a relatively huge flying scroll, a Megillah in Hebrew. Uh, these were usually made of animal skins. This one is so big that the rabbi said that even the skin of an elephant or the skin of a camel will not be to the measure. It was 20 by 10 cubits, which is about 20 by 10 meters, if you want, or 30 by 15 uh, feet. Okay, the approximate size of a two-car garage, just to give you an idea. But why is this scroll flying over the whole world? And what is written in it? Verse 3 speaks of the curse that goes over the face of the whole earth. But what is that curse? Could it be the Torah itself? Could it be the Mosaic law as many rabbis believe? While the law contains many blessings, it also contains many curses. And these are there to awaken the reader of the danger that is coming. So when he sees them, he can run to God for safety and salvation. This is the purpose of the curses. This is the purpose of the law. The blessings, they already took for granted. But they did not notice the curses. And this really is the message of grace. One that comes in the midst of the most difficult period in man's history. And there's something wonderful about the measurements of the flying scroll. Why are we giving these measurements? It's not really big. It's not really small either. I want to tell you something. For those who were building the temple at the time of Zachariah, it must have been an obvious message to them. 
the one area that is 20 by 10 cubits was the entrance of the Holy of Holies, as you have it in the picture. Right? It is called the Ulam, Ulam, an important place right before the entrance of God, after that door. The place inside was 20 by 10 cubits. The door gives to the Ulam, which gives to the holy place where you have the menorah, the table of bread, and the altar of incense. And the last home is the Holy of Holies where God symbolically dwells or dwelt. The Ulam... They called, they called it the heart of the ancient, who were filled with wisdom and understanding. This is the place where the priest actually rendered judgments. This is where Aaron wore the breastplate of judgment over his heart, called the Urim and Tumim. He would wear it at this place. This is also the place where the high priest stood and recited the ironic blessing upon the priest, as the Mishnah said. It is the prayer we usually end our study with. It is from this place that the rabbis in the Midrash Rabbi imagined the flying scroll flying from it, from the Ark of the Covenant right through the door and right over the world. And why the Ark of the Covenant? There's also, we're going to find a second place where there is the 20 by 10 cubits measurement, only two places. It is the area formed by the two cherubims over the Ark of the Covenant, which contains the Ten Commandments. And so they said, this is it. The law is going to the whole world before the final world. And so it is as if the cherubims themselves perhaps came out of the Holy of Holies okay, with the scroll, with the message of the law, and brought it right to the people of the world for their salvation before the final wars. And furthermore, see that the message is staff is taken right from the table of the law. The scroll is divided into two sections, like the tables of the law. Two commandments are chosen, one from each side of the table, right? Look at verse 3 again. Every thief that is expelled according to the side of the scroll, every pursuer shall be expelled according to that side of it. The two commandments, or that is, the Ten Commandments are, that are chosen here, okay, or the two commandments are chosen out of the Ten Commandments are that of the oath and that of the swearing. These two together, I want to tell you, represent the whole law. Because the Ten Commandments, from which the other 603 commandments flow, are divided into two sections. The first one deals with our relationship with God. The second one deals with our relationship with man, vertical and then horizontal. And so we find the third law there. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This is what is written. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And the eighth one, you shall not steal. And see that in verse 3 begins with the second part. And not what we may deem the most important, right? How come he, come, he begins with the second part and not the first part? Perhaps because this is the easiest one to realize. Every religion, by the way, every sect today will pretend they know God and think that they may fulfill the first five commandments. But no man can claim that, for instance, he never stole something. Right? A pen, maybe? A pencil? Right? Or something else, whether it's a pencil or even a moment of time belonging to another, to an employer, to God. Jesus used the same strategy when he confronted the rich man in Matthew 19. You know, the rich man came to him and he says, he says what shall I do to have eternal life, right? The answer is absolutely nothing, by the way. Okay, for salvation is too expensive for anyone to afford, but it is given for free through Yeshua. But we need to recognize this. This is what the man needed to learn. So Jesus brings him to the law and begins to enumerate the first four of the second part of the commandment. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And like the flying scroll, he went from the easiest to the hardest. But after each one, the man should have said, guilty, guilty, guilty. But he did not understand. He said to Jesus, he says, all these things I've kept from my youth. That's not true. That's not true, right? This is sad. 
And concerning the oath, there's something that God says that brings it to another level, a much higher level. See what he says in verse 4 again. The one who swears falsely by my name. They know him by my name. Who are these who use the name of God falsely? Could it be speaking of world religions today? The next vision is about world religion. All religions recognize God. They know him, but so few worship him as he declares himself from the word of God. And this commandment is so linked with the others. The one about stealing. What these two, by the way? They go so well together because the one who's really being robbed is God. They steal his name. They steal his honor, his majesty, and they appropriate his throne and they sit on it. The thief here is really the one who pronounced a false oath. And these days, by the way, we can say that it is not the age of the oath, right? Because so many are broken. It seems that it's increasing. What kind of oath do we see broken today? Over and over, here and there. A big one is that of marriage oaths, which was made in front of God. Many, even in Christianity, are not afraid of God anymore, and they defy him by breaking this solemn oath. Many say that because we are children of God, a father will eventually pardon all his children, and so they continue to break the law. Let, let me tell you a true story. You know, two sons of an officer in the Atlanta po police force were convicted of burglary on their father's evidence and sentenced to two years in jail. The two boys were arrested by their father, by the way. And the act of burglary, uh, actually, they were caught, and he appeared in court as prosecutor. So the father, in giving evidence, said, I tried to raise my boys right, and it nearly killed me when I found them trying to rob the store. And I feel, feel it my duty under my oath as an officer to arrest them and prosecute them. To this, the judge answered, this is indeed a real man and an officer who has the highest possible regard of this oath. Our heavenly father is not only compassionate, but just as well. Okay? Love must yield where disobedience calls for justice. This is why he came down. He could not do more than that, to come down to die for our sins. It's up to us to make that other step. Another oath many break is when they change their minds about a promise, about a yes or a no. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than this is from the evil one. This is Matthew 5.37. If one makes an oath, the oath must be kept without any reservation. We must affirm what we say. Otherwise, how do you think that the people outside are going to listen to us? Now see the universality of the message. A flying scroll that goes over where? The face of the whole earth, it says. That the gospel will go over the whole world during the tribulation times is something that was prophesied in many places in the scriptures. The first is Jesus. In Matthew 24, as he spoke of the calamities of the last three and a half years, he said in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And this is when he shows up. Right? While the tribulation is described as a time never seen before and a time which will never be repeated, yet it is a time of the greatest revival ever in history. Isn't that great? The greatest revival in history was not with Jonah, by the way, it was a great one with him, who brought, you know how many people he brought to his saving knowledge of Yeshua, of God? 600,000 people. It wasn't that of the church through the last 2,000 years, but it will be during the tribulation time. The best is yet to come. Yes? This true grace, this is, by the way, true grace. And all the nation rise when the, all the nation that is rise against the believers, the believers respond with love in preaching the word of God. See the strong contrast here? Even in the most evil time, God will do some great things. We read in, in Revelation 7. I know I showed you this. I want to show it to you again. It says, after these things, 
Okay, this is when John is brought up there. I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nation, tribes, people, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with the white robes, with the palm branches in their hands. Who are these people in heaven? These were actually those who came out of the tribulation. Because in verse 14, it says, these are the one, because John asked, these are the one who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So it would be a great time even then for evangelism. Furthermore, Zacharias' flying scroll could be located in two other places in the book of Revelation. The first place is just before the final vials or bowls are poured by God himself. Okay, And this is where we see a flying gospel. <laughs> Listen to Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. It corresponds, by the way, to the flying scroll in Zechariah. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongues, and, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. See how it's defined. The everlasting gospel, the only one which was proclaimed from the beginning, and this must be the same message of the flying scroll. These two verses in Revelation 14 come after the sealing just before of the 144,000, who will be the one who will begin to proclaim the everlasting gospel. They will be followed by thousands, and I believe millions, who will announce the good news of the world. 40, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. See, all the tribes are still there, intact. And like it is in the next vision in Zechariah, in Revelation 14, after the everlasting gospel, the fall of Babylon is prophesied, just like the chronology of Zechariah. The other place is Revelation chapter 8. When the seventh seal is opened and gives way to the trumpet and the vials, both chapter 8 and 14 speak of the same moment as Revelation gives two rendering of the tribulation. And there we read, when he opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for about how long? Half an hour. Half an hour. Why, why this pause and why half an hour? You know, in Revelation, it was, by the way, a pause for prayer. A pause for prayer. And surely they, they were actually praying for what would happen next on earth. Look at the next verses in Revelation 8, 2 to 3. It says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel, having a golden censer, remember this, came and stood at the altar and was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was given before, that is, the throne. It was a time where all the prayers, it seems that all the prayers of believers were collected and poured at the throne, at the, the feet of the throne of God. And I believe that it may even includes our prayers today. Now, what, why really half an hour? There's another very powerful message here. You know that it was estimated that in the, in the Mishnah, that the length of time needed for a priest to perform the offering in the incense in the holy place was half an hour. From the moment he took the coals from the altar of sacrifice, as you can see in the in the arrow, okay, to the altar inside, okay, of prayer, if you want, of incense, it took him half an hour. And the same pose is taken in heaven for the burning, again, of the incense, which symbolizes, as we have seen, which symbolizes the prayer. And we notice that the angel has also in his hands a golden censer, like the priest and the temple. It was a time of prayer. And we see then that in both books, Zachariah, with the flying scroll of Revelation, with the everlasting gospel, and the half hour is the last appeal, the closing call to salvation. And I believe it is the same gospel, the same one that we read today. It is our Bible, and it too contains the curses for those who defy God. It contains the words we need to share with others. Yeshua spoke much about these judgments, a section we often leave out, 
when we proclaim the gospel. Isn't that true? We kind of leave the curses and bring the love. That's fine too, but we need to bring both sides. Preaching the gospel is to give the whole truth, not only part of it. And today, the, the people whom we speak to need to realize that there's another side to the offer and that they do not have eternity to decide. Paul said, and I love this verse in 2 Corinthians, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now, now is the day of salvation. You know, that was said 2,000 years ago, not during the time of the tribulation. And Paul, by the way, was quoting Isaiah, who said it 700 years before him. These words are important because no one knows what tomorrow will bring. If you understand the message today, you may not tomorrow or maybe in an hour from now. This is when if you hear the word of God and you think it is true, grab it. Grab it, because it may fly away. Let me tell you another story, the title I would title, The Candle in the Wind. It's about an ancient king in whose country a rebellion developed. This king set out with an army to quell the insur insurrection. Soon things were in control again with the rebel army defeated. So the king who had made his headquarters in one of the castles at that distant province, placed a candle in the archway over the entrance of the castle. Lighting the candle, he then announced that if all who were rebellion, who in rebellion, that is, against him, would surrender and take an oath of loyalty while the candle was still burning, they would be spared. Here, I want to tell you, is clemency, but only for the time of the life of the candle. But in our lives, is like the light of a candle, okay? And, and can be put away very fast. This is why the offer of salvation is always there. But don't delay. Don't delay. That's what the Bible says. And with all this, now we can better understand how graciously these curses are given in verse 3 by considering one important word. Let's read verse 3 again. Chapter 5, verse 3. Then he said to me, this is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole earth. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on the one side. And everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing of the other side. This is, I want to tell, not an easy verse to read. Because the word purge repeated twice is actually acquitted. Acquitted. In Hebrew is nikah. It is used 44 times in the Hebrew scriptures. From Naka, meaning in the majority of time, and punish, set free, innocent, blameless. How can we read this verse with these words here? Perhaps this word is used to convey God's greater grace. When God presents the curses in the flying scroll, it is with the intent to save, not to condemn. Surely, he says, everyone who steals will be acquitted because God is love. And love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Right? First Corinthians 13. This is the starting point with love. And he wants, because he wants the best out of everyone. And see the measure of grace and mercy in the next verse. We read that God, saying in his word, he says, It shall enter the house of the thief, and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house for." The whole night. Why does it remain in the midst of the house for that long? Or that is, why would it spend the whole night within its presence, like the New American Standard Bible says? Why the whole night and not just pour out the judgment and finish with it? This is our God. He will struggle with each one of us, okay, and he will try to pull out anything he can to bring the people to a saving knowledge of Yeshua. This is who he really is. Aren't you glad to have a God like this who doesn't condemn right away? Right? And until when is the Lord going to struggle with men? See the end of the verse. It has a double sense. It says, and consume it with the timber and stones, right? In verse 4, what do the timber and stones represent? It often describes two different things, a home or an idol, right? 
Both are often made with timber and stones, and so it is either one or the other that will be consumed. If the person recognizes his faults and sees the salvation of Yeshua, then his idols, his old religion, his past ways will be destroyed and a new life will begin. Like the Spirit says in 2 Corinthians, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If not, the home itself is destroyed. However, what we should remember is the way the Lord approaches the individual with love, mercy, and grace. This is a lesson for us. This is a lesson for us. When it comes to the commandments of God, it was, I believe, Warren Worsby who said, the only commandment many people worry about is, that shall not get caught. Okay. You know, soon uh, all Canadians will be filing their taxes, and in a survey I just read, they found that 63% of the people who will file their taxes, they do it because they are afraid to get caught. Not because we need to do it to support our society and our country, but because they do not want to get caught. This is why we need the laws. To close this vision, these two laws of the oath and stealing, which really represent the Ten Commandments, thus the whole 613 commandments, seems to be coming out of the Holy of Holies, from the Ark of the Covenant, through the doorway, the Ulam, to be seen by the whole world. And it will be during the tribulation time, a time of great harvest for souls where the word of God will come mightily to each one to confront the individual so that his timber and stone, his idols, will be replaced by the truth of God. However, for those who refuse, in the next vision, something else flies in the sky. That something is called the wickedness that will fall upon the whole world. So it starts with the offer, and then he tells you what comes next. Let's briefly and for now uh, go over the next vision, which is the sequel of refusing the message of the flying scroll. Let's read verses 5 to 8. Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, lift your eyes now and see what is this that goes forth. So I asked, what is it? And he said, it is a basket that is going forth. He also said, this is the resemblance throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted. And this is a woman sitting inside the basket. Then he said, this is the wickedness. And he thrust her down in the basket and threw the lead over her mouth. What follows... Uh, the flying scroll is a flying basket. What is this basket and what's in it? The word for basket is really unusual. It is only here translated basket, but it's a basket. The word is effa, which is a measure uh, of solid or liquid, about 19 liters or five gallons, right? But why call this basket an effa? You know, Kim Ki, a rabbinical commentator, understood that the effa in the effort to signify that God had measured out to them measure for measure. The effort then is a reminder that in the tribulation time is indeed a time of judgment for the nation of Israel and also for all the world. And every judgment is waited. No more, no less. No less. Until then, over the effort was a heavy cover, right? A kikar in Hebrew, that is a talent made of lead, which weigh about 35 kilo or 75 pounds. It's a heavy cover for this size basket. This is to show that wickedness is constrained until the time of the tribulation. And why is it made of lead? Why? Perhaps because it was relatively worthless, right? At, at the time, it was worthless. And also because the metal is heavy, but also fragile. Does that remind you of something? It reminds us of the feet of the Nebuchadnezzar statue, from gold to silver to bronze, and then a mixture of iron and stone, which, is, like lead, is a very soft metal, if you want to become a soft metal, and no much worth. And why does the basket, what does it contain? Wickedness itself, with an article, by the way. And it's the only time this word is with an article. The Hebrew is rasai, is translated by words like criminal, guilt, wrong. It represents all of the evil in that one basket. And see where the basket is taken. Let's read verses 9 to 11, and we'll understand 
what this wickedness represents. Verses 9. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming from the wind with their wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And he said to me, to build a house, for it is in the land of Shinar, where it is ready, the basket be set there on its foundation, on its pedestal. Where is the basket of the wickedness brought? It says the land of Shinar. You know what this is? Babylon. Babylon. There it is again. It never died. The spirit of rebellion, right, still roams the earth and occupies many hearts. But why not simply say Babylon instead of saying Shinar? Perhaps this is to bring us back to the origin of rebellion, to the Tower of Babel, right in Genesis chapter 11. After the flood, you know, men got together and we read that it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. You know what they did there? They built a tower. This is when they built a tower from where we have the word Babylon. By the way, you know, in Hebrew, the word Babylon is not there. It's always Babel, Babel, so that we remember where it comes from. This is when men got together and said, come, let us make bricks to bake them thoroughly, Right? Come, let us build our, ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in heaven, right? Let, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. See the rebellious words they use? They said, come, let us build, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. This is a direct contradiction to the commandment of God that he gave in Genesis 9 when he says, Be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. They knew of this commandment. They knew God. They knew of the flood. And the reason behind the flood, because Shem was there. He told them all about it. But they rebelled against God and decided not to go with him. This is what they're doing today. This is what they will do at the end. The Spirit here brings out their real motive rejection of God. And what do they want instead of God? They say, let us make bricks. Let us build a tower. Let us make a name. Three times, right? They, they want God to depart so they could make their own tower, their city, a name for themselves. As if they said to God, let us, let us, leave us alone. This is what they're saying today. And see the level of rebellion, by the way, in Genesis. We read in verse 4 that they burnt, uh, they burnt the brink thoroughly, thoroughly. That is, through a very high fire, as, as hot as it could be, so it could last very long. They were determined to let go of God. It is the same type of rebellion we can expect to increase in our world, just like the epistles are teaching us as well. This is the very rebellion we will find at the end. And this passage brings us right to the end of the book of Revelation. Revelation 17, 19. The Babylon overtakes the world and falls. We'll look at this a little later. That is next time. You know, to conclude, we notice that the scroll, the everlasting gospel, comes right after the opening of the seals in Revelation. However... At the time of the opening of the seals in Revelation 5, you know, no one could open up the seals. No one. Or no one could open up the first seals and go on to the seventh. And there, I want to tell you, we're brought to a very moving scene. Where John, realizing that no one could open the seals, actually he wept. He was weeping. He must have understood that within these seven seals was included the gospel for salvation for so many in the tribulation time. This is when one angel comes to him and brings the, his attention to the Messiah. And then he tells him in Revelation 5.5, 5, Do not weep. Do not weep, John. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. And as John turned to see the lion of Judah, who did he see? A lamb as though it was slain. Yeah? Here we see the many paradoxes we find in the, in the Bible. A lion who is the lamb. The father who is the son. Yet they are so distinct. And the Messiah being the lamb becomes a main theme in the book of Revelation. 
You know, in the New Testament, outside of Revelation, Yeshua is called the Lamb of God four times. But in Revelation, he appears as the Lamb 31 times. That's the flying scroll, the power of the flying scroll. This book really speaks about redemption and salvation, as does Zachariah, which also points to the Lamb slain, and through whom we are saved from the wickedness. Now, what do we do with all this information? We saw the urgency, the evil, the prayers of the believers, which seem to be stuck somewhere and kept for this last moment to be poured at the feet of God. All of this, I want to tell you, I tell us that we cannot just be spectators. We must begin to pray and see how the Lord wants us to be part of this battle and this victory to come. This is why we are given so much information about the future. You know, I will close with an apparently true story about being an effective witness. So the story brings us in the late 1800s about a great evangelist, Dwight L. Moody, who once saw a man freezing to death in the street of Chicago, where he built actually a college, which is still there today. So Moody uh, could not just talk this man into warmth. So he pounded him with his fist and got him really angry. And the man began to pound him back and then got up and ran after Moody. And Moody ran faster. He couldn't catch him, by the way. But that got his blood circulating and it saved his life. Maybe we should do something like this. You know, people who don't listen, okay? And tell them about what the Lord says that, right? We have to be nice, of course. But I think that was a good story. Let, let's bow our head in prayer. Our great and glorious God, remind us today of those old and sturdy words that we, we read in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and be troubled through the mountains, shake with its swelling. Lord, reminds us to be still and know that you are God. Remind us that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And for those here today needing this very present help in trouble, I ask that you display yourself to them, dislodge fear from them, undertake for them, multiply grace and peace unto them. And may the evil be soon crushed under their feet. We pray in Yeshua's name and to the congregation. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Who shall